back to Crimes from the East. I'm your host, Pia, and with me is Alex. Hello, Alex. Well, hello, stranger. We weren't on break, but we kind of took a little break, didn't we? (laughs) Yeah. It was summer. It was summertime. And we only get so many months of warm weather. Best exploited. Went from heat wave and just like hot all the time. And now I'm literally wearing two pairs of pants and three like layers on the top. Oh, so did like Europe skip the fall season, went straight to winter? Yeah, yeah, no, no, we just went straight to winter. That's just how it, that's just how it is here, I think. But this year feels particularly like abrupt. I'm kind of mad about it. I feel like in the future when they talk about when, you know, climate crisis started, it would be 2022. They'd be like, that's the year when the weather went crazy. When what was the year that they named a movie after? Isn't it 2022? There was like a climate change movie where it was like the year 2022 and all of the cities got flooded and you know. These <laughs> I think it was 2012. Movies. 10 years earlier. Yeah, yeah, close enough. In the, you know, grand expanse that is time and space. What is that? Yeah, or Earth is like 4.2 billion years old. What yeah. is a few thousand years? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. A mini climate change moment, probably. Yeah, it's just, you know, this cycle of humanity is nearing its conclusion. I hope we come out of this with, like, cool mods. <laughs> like little antennas on our heads and, like, telepathic communication. You don't even need to talk to people. You can just be, like, in your minds, get the hell out of here. I want, like, the armadillo mod where you can just, like, into a ball. <laughs> Curl up like a little worm. Yeah, exactly. Nice. With a nice shell over you. No one can get in there. My personal space. I like that idea. <laughs> so today's case is so heavy. At least for me, it was It was so heavy just researching this story. Very depressing and dark. And I was like, what the heck are we going to talk about before we start talking about the case? But I, I, I know, Alex, you had some local news you wanted to share well just like a normandy true crime alert my very friendly she is a friendly neighbor speaks french with me and every time i see her she's telling me about how there's some like crazy person in town who has been abducting cats (gasps) and like torturing them Oh my god. It's so scary. So basically she just doesn't want me to let my cats out because I had been letting my cats sort of just wander around in the hallway of my building. Mm. And I think she was just annoyed because of the hair ultimately. Yeah. Did she make up this story or is this true? Have you heard about it? I don't know. Else? I don't like talk to that many people in this town. I'm still kinda weirdly new here. I think you should use this as an icebreaker with strangers. Have you heard about the cat yes. mutilator? <laughs> I should start like a a group, a community watch. Like a meetup? To find the... Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, And she doesn't know that we do this, that I do this podcast with Mm -hmm. you and that I like am, you know, let's say interested in true crime. So she has no idea that she has sent my like serial killer soup senses tingling and I'm like, oh my God, there's a serial (laughs) killer in the making. There's some young person who has like sick fantasies and they always start with animals and next it will be humans. And so, yeah. For all you know, it's her. She's trying to play a game with you. Oh my God. Oh, there's a cat killer out there. (laughs) It's totally not me. (laughs) well yeah keep your cats indoors till you find out if this is uh truth or fiction alex my cats are so dumb they wouldn't last five minutes out there they're beautiful and stupid they're just ripe for the for the plucking as they should be we don't want cats to get smarter than they already are i don't know i think it could be kind of fun so anyways yeah this story is it's it is depressing it's heavy but it's also like very creepy and eerie mm-hmm. and there's a strange masala going on and that, that, that i kind of like you know guilty not pleasure but it, it has made it a fascinating one to sort of hear about and i'm excited to talk about it so there's something about it that's still very mysterious even though we kind totally. of know what happened but we don't really know what happened 
it kind of took the world by storm. Netflix even made a documentary on it. So yeah, let me tell you what it is, everyone, listeners. We're doing the Burari family deaths today. I don't want to call them suicides or murders because truly we don't know what it was. This episode is going to have mentions of suicide, mentions of young children losing their life, descriptions of how the bodies were found. If you would find this distressing at this point, I'd suggest you skip this episode and listen to another one. Just wanted to put this disclaimer out there. It's a disturbing family story, mm -hmm. yeah. to say the least. So I'm calling the episode The Burari Banyan Tree Ritual. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is a very complicated story with lots of moving parts and things to discuss. So we're going to split it into two episodes. Today's episode, we'll talk about the crime scene, the family history, the role of Lalit, and of course, the diaries that were found. Mm. And in the next episode, we'll cover some of the other stuff, more speculations and, um, and not so black and white <laughs> type theories. We're going to talk pipes next episode, right? <laughs> yes, we're going to talk about the pipes. I'm excited for that. Okay. All right, right on. Let's go. Let's go. So today's case is haunting, chilling, mysterious, and one that unfortunately has no plausible explanation. You might be left feeling a little frustrated and also a little spooked out because of the esoteric nature of this crime. Mm -hmm. Even today, there is some doubt on whether any crime was in fact committed. Even though an entire family of 11 members was wiped out in one night. And this is the story of the Burari family deaths. One of the main sources of today's episode is, of course, the Netflix documentary on the case called House of Secrets. It is very well made, very objective and subjective, kind of mm -hmm. unbiased, of course. They've tried to get all the information from all angles, from families and friends and the police, and try to at least give you whatever they know, and then leave it up to you to decide what really happened. House of Secrets. I really liked one article by the Hindustan Times, which I will link on our website. So go check that out, where they tell you a little bit about each family member of this Bhatia family. I found that interesting. More than the crime, it's about the people. Because that's really what the core of this case is, the people. Oh, yeah. 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 What happened to them? What happened? So let's start at the crime scene. On the 1st of July, 2018, the busy town of Sant Nagar in Burari, the outskirts of Delhi, started to stir as the sun rose up. Now, every morning around 5.30 a.m., which is too early for me. This is when most productive normal people <laughs> wake up, I think. <laughs> The Patia family's grocery store opened up for early morning milk and newspaper pickups by local residents. But on this day, on the 1st of July, something was off. The store hadn't been opened. It was late. At 7.15 a.m., a neighbor and a friend of the family, Mr. Gurcharan Singh, he called the store owner, Bhavnesh Bhatia, on his cell phone to check on why the store was closed. All the newspapers mm -hmm. were piled up. The milk crates were still there. People were anxious. They were lining up. They needed to get their day going. Yeah, go about their day. There was no reply to the call. So Mr. Singh went to check on the Bhatia family as their home was just a few steps away from the grocery store. He found that the front door was unlocked. And so he opened the door and walked up the stairs to the main living area. And he gasped in horror. He saw the Bhatia family hanging from the ceiling, lifeless, their feet barely touching the floor. The scene appeared spine-chilling because they were all found in nearly identical states of binding. All of their heads were wrapped in white cloth cut from the same bedsheet. They were all blindfolded, their mouths were gagged and sealed shut with medical tape. Mm. Their hands and feet were tied up with cloth some were reinforced with bound wires. Nine members of the family were suspended in a group from the iron bars in the ceiling, while a tenth family member was hanging from a door frame opposite them. On the floor in the adjacent room lay deceased the family matriarch, 77-year-old Narayani Devi. Her body was half-turned with 
her face on the floor. She had a belt around her neck and had ligature marks on her neck as well. The family dog was tied up on the roof and was barking nonstop in apparent distress. All the family members had nooses around their necks that were tied to iron rods that were fitted into the open roof, meant to serve as a skylight of sorts. And in a macabre way, they appeared to look like the hanging roots of a banyan tree. Overnight, the Bhatia family had been wiped out. No one could make sense of the situation. Was this murder, suicide, or something else? And who had done this and why? It was all too overwhelming for this close-knit, simple community of middle-class families in Sant Nagar. Now, Mr. Singh, he ran out and informed all the neighbors and eventually one of them called the police to this unbelievable and most disturbing scene. It's a very vivid image. It's such a distinctly creepy, like, horror movie image. It seems to be carefully planned and designed to have some kind of a visual impact right, on whoever yeah. finds them. Mm -hmm. It's not so much just how they died, but also how they would be found. Yeah, there was an arrangement to it. That's like kind of the creepiest part so far. You know, the shock effect is really there. Now, among the deceased were 77-year-old Naraini Devi, her 57-year-old daughter Pratiba, her 50-year-old son Bhuvnesh, her 45-year-old son Lalit, and all of the families of these three individuals. Now, their families consisted of 33 year old daughter Priyanka, this is Pratibha's daughter, Bhavnesh's wife Savita, she was 43, I believe, and their three children, Neetu, 25 year old, Menaka, 23 year old, and Dhruv, who was just 15, Lalit's wife Tina, and their only child, 15 year old Shivam. So the two boys were the same age, basically, the cousins. They were, were the, the youngest? Age. Yes. They were 15. So we basically have the matriarch, her children, and then her children's Children. Families. Her grandchildren. Grandchildren. How many generations are we talking here? Three generations. Okay. So there are nine adults and two minors. Okay. But some of the adults or children were grandchildren too. Yes. I mean, we think of them as children because that's how kind of Asian families function, right? Even if you're an adult, you're still a child in the eyes of your parents and your elder relatives. You're still treated like a child. Mm -hmm. So we're calling them children, but they were 25 and 23, 33 years old. And they probably didn't have much power or veto in family matters, I'm sure. Was everyone living in the same house? Yes. Okay. They were. The only member of the family found alive was the family's dog, Tommy, who was found up on the roof tied to the very same iron grate that the family was hanging from. Now, the dog was utterly distressed, and sadly, he died a month later of cardiac arrest. Poor Tommy! Ugh, dogs! He clearly experienced all of the trauma. Yeah, I feel real bad for the dog. Tommy! That was cruel of them. They should have just let him go. Let just him let go. Him go. Okay, yeah. we need to get to like what happens so that we can. This I think is going to have to be a topic of further discussion in the next episode. What about Tommy? What they should have done for Tommy, yeah. <laughs> Shortly after discovery, the story spread like wildfire. A huge crowd gathered around the home and surrounding streets. People were morbidly curious as well as utterly frightened because it seemed so sinister so senseless and so unusual. But this one was different. This one was creepy. This one was absurd. Police arrived in large numbers to try and take control of the scene. Even the chief minister of Delhi, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal, came to the scene. He came to the home to ensure that the right caliber of police attention was given to this case. Because you assume that because a case is so unusual or so highly publicized that it will be handled the right way and that cops will do the right thing. But, oh my God, that is so not the case. So many major crimes in India 
have been completely bungled up by <laughs> the local cops. Say. Well, actually, this happens everywhere. It's not just India, but so many really bad policemen. It's a really good you know, example of cops being humans too and getting all caught up in the hullabaloo of like, you know, a media sensationalized situation and not always thinking straight and handling things according to protocol because, yeah, whatever, they get all riled. Yeah, and we've discussed this before. Not all policemen have the training and do not know how to handle forensics, how to handle evidence and how to secure a scene. Even if they're supposed to know it, they may not actually know it. They may not actually practice it at every crime scene. Right. It started from the top. The chief minister came down and I think he set the tone Mm -hmm. for this case. And he kind of made it known that I want this handled the right way and the right people have to get on this. I don't want this bungled up like some of the other major crimes that have occurred in the area, like the Noida double murder, which we have still not covered, completely destroyed by the cops on scene. Oof, okay. And so right away, the elite crime branch of Delhi was engaged in this case, and they started collecting forensic evidence to try and piece together what happened in the early hours of the 1st of July to this Bhatia family. Now, even though they are the elite, they are the elite crime branch, and yes, they did get all the evidence and everything, when I watched the documentary... This whole home was surrounded by the public and media and cops. They caught everything. So when they were bringing evidence out, no one was wearing gloves. Oh, my God. Stuff they found was just shoved into bags. Yeah. They weren't even kept in, like, plastic evidence bags or anything. Yeah. Even if you think you know what happened and you don't really need to find the DNA or fingerprints or whatever... You should be following protocol, right? There should be a strict protocol. And so that was disappointing. And I really, I, (laughs) crime branch, you have disappointed me. Uh Uh-oh. Calling them out. People suspected the involvement of occult practices in this case. Superstition or black magic. Yeah, I mean, definitely something fishy going on. I would either go occult or like gang. Yeah. It's like a gang message. But for a family, you know, the local shop that sells milk and newspapers in the morning, you wouldn't really. So um, maybe we're going to talk about this later. But is the number 11? I mean, what is that number about? You know, numerology wise? I'm sure people have looked into that. And Yes, the media had a field day with that number. And if you look back at all the news clips from that time several news outlets have focused so much on the number 11 there were 11 bars in the right iron window in the home there are 11 holes in the pipes or whatever they had 11 bricks in the front of the home just just total nonsense (laughs) or is it or is it it's possible that it was intentionally done by the family because Yes, like numerology is big in India and all of South Asia and even Asia. Mm -hmm. Numerology and people change their names to better their prospects and they think it's good luck if you have certain letters in your name or numbers on your car license plate and all that stuff. People do that. It's Mm -hmm. definitely common. It's not like too much of a stretch to assume that they did do that, but that has nothing to do with the actual crime. Right. That's just indulging in nonsense by the media you know just to sensationalize the story right yeah they thought about black magic and sinister stuff but not many considered then or even now that this was perhaps something caused by spiraling uncontrolled mental illness perhaps caused by past trauma that is not something people wanted to talk about or accept or even blame Because of the stigma involved around mental illness in society. You have to get there eventually, but this is going to sound crass, but that's like no fun for your brain to go there first. I think the brain wants to go to sort of a magical place, even if it's a dark, messed up magical place. Because the blame then goes somewhere else. Yeah, and it just... 
pointing the finger back at society. Right, yeah. Now that we talked about the discovery of this horrific scene, let's talk about the family a little bit. Let's get to know them a little better, where they came from, where they were going, how, you know, how this came to be. Now, these bits are sourced from testimonies of friends and neighbors of the family. Every single person asked would shower the family with praises. And that seemed oddly optimistic and helpful and kind and generous and loving of a family. Like too much, you know, like too much. Yeah. Like get a room family, but don't because that's gross. Yeah. Odd because they seem too good to be true. I know some families like that, but yeah. <laughs> I think that's just <laughs> because, I don't know, our family's like pretty, pretty chill, but we're not like, we're not like ooey gooey. So when I see ooey gooey families, I'm always like, what are, what are you hiding? Yeah. What are you hiding? What are you trying to like distract from? Right. Yeah. yeah. There's more to the story. But this goes to show that people didn't want to think about that, didn't want to look into it even if it seemed odd they just wanted to accept what was given to them at face value which was picture perfect happiness i mean that's like the ideal socially right so it mm-hmm. it's great to have a model that reinforces that social expectation and ideal so even if it's not perfect i think people are inclined to like want to believe in it to reinforce their like worldview in general It's marketed that way that you have to be this, you know, hippie, happy, greeny family at all times and everything has to be butterflies and rainbows, you know, that you can't struggle whatsoever, at least publicly, or need to ask for help. That's just, it's perceived as weakness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Bhatias, they went out of their way to help people in need. I mean, they were at least good people. That, That much we can tell. Maybe something was going on. In the background, but it's not like they were faking it. They were truly being sincere. Mm -hmm. So they would help people in need. They would mind children of their neighbors and friends. They needed to watch the kids for days. Someone had to go somewhere. They'd leave the kids with them. They would feed whomever was hungry and without a means to help themselves. They were cheerful and social. Just a very normal middle class Indian joint family. Mm -hmm. Now, a joint family is basically when members of a large family live together. So, like, different family units live under one roof. Mm -hmm. So, these three siblings, Pratibha, Bhavnesh, and Lalit, live together with their mother and their families under one roof. This is called a joint family. Mm -hmm. The 11 members of the family lived in an 1,100-square-foot, two-story home. That's not a lot of space. Yeah, that that doesn't sound like enough for 11 people. (laughs) There wasn't too much room there, not much privacy. Everyone was sharing a bedroom. That's just normal. That's fine for big cities and suburbs where one billion people have to kind of make it together. Yeah, they lived in this tiny two-story home in the tightly packed Sant Nagar society. And each home in this society was mere inches from the next. Mm -hmm. So not only inside the home, but outside the home, there is no space and not much chance of having privacy. Mm -hmm. Everyone pretty much knew what the other was up to. Yeah. Or so it seemed. Right. (laughs) No kidding. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of these younger members of the family. 25-year-old Neetu had her bachelor's degree and was searching for a job. She would write positive, motivational, and religious quotes on boards outside of the family stores. Her sister Menika, who was 23, was academically gifted and was pursuing a degree in forensic science. Oh, interesting. That means she had a logical brain, a rational brain, a scientific brain. Yeah. Not just some easily influenced gullible individual who was only operating on the emotional spectrum. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask, you know, this like generosity of spirit that the family showed and their sort of like good will towards the neighborhood. Was it like very religiously connected? Yes, possibly. Helping your friends and neighbors and taking care of any guest to your home as if they were a form of God is part of the religion, the culture. Atiti Devo Bhavo, which means any guest is a form of God. 
and you have mm. to treat them with the amount of respect that you would give your own god and so maybe they took it seriously they they were really living that way and living in service to others like the friends and neighbors said it didn't seem fake or put on they were sincere yeah but they were also relatively modern it sounds like it's not like they were traditional and sort of like old super old fashioned cuz like everyone's getting educated and is involved in in the community and yeah so there's there's some different levels i feel like this whole idea of being traditional or backwards or you know restricting it doesn't come into play in this family all the women were educated and not just school but college they got their bachelors masters and they were being encouraged to study even more find jobs it's not like they were told to just put a pallo or a sari on your head cover your face and sit at home get right. in the kitchen no yeah. that's not that's not how things were working in this family they were forward liberal modern you know thinking of them as individuals and not just curtailing their personalities yeah. right it appears to be very open but it didn't seem to affect the outcome it's so strange it kind of puts me in this state of cognitive dissonance. Right. It's not making sense. It's paradoxical. I'm trying to find where we can find some like sense of reason or, yeah. you know, culpability, like any markers or signs, but you can't really find one yet so far. So 23-year-old Manika, who was pursuing forensic science she was also trained in kathak and she was an excellent dancer she had won many local dance contests so again a, an example of how social they were yeah. encouraging and supporting they were 33 year old priyanka worked in a large it company and she was recently engaged recently as in just 13 days before the incident oh my gosh lucky you Lucky the husband hadn't joined the joint family yet, I guess, for him. Now, strangely, Priyanka had not told anyone at work about her engagement and was seen as a reserved person by her colleagues. And I don't find that weird. That's totally normal. Like some people just keep to themselves. They, you know, work is work, family is family. They don't like to mix the two, so I don't I don't find that unusual. Yeah. Both the boys, Dhruv and Shivam, who were 15 at the time, were avid sportsmen and loved cricket and soccer respectively they were good in studies and were never in any kind of trouble at school which is unusual because 15 year old boys yeah some kind of trouble you'd start to wonder like what's going on what's going on in this school something stupid you have to do something stupid and get caught you don't have to be fight you just you know like but no they were good kids as the teachers all agreed they agreed that they were good kids a little too good nothing about them ever hinted of there being any dysfunction in the family now let's look into the past of this picture perfect family the family unit originally hailed from tohana in the state of haryana which is a neighboring state of delhi the patriarch of the family bhopal singh chundawar he had moved from his native state of rajasthan to haryana to work on a farm owned by a Sikh Bhatia family. So their original last name was Chundawat. Now the farmer Mr. Bhatia, he was so impressed with Bhopal Singh's work ethic and his noble personality that he got his daughter Narayani Devi married to him. Okay. Bhopal Singh became a devoted garjamai or stay at home son-in-law. Okay. In the sense she didn't marry and go to his home he married her and stayed at her home yeah i was going to say so he took her name too yes they legally took the name of bhatia leaving their chundawat identity behind interesting that's not common is it no not at all this is not common it speaks to the open mindedness of bhopal singh basically because it yeah. would be considered like you know a loss of your family line or lineage or honor or whatever right. by doing all of these things garjamai is not something you want to aspire to whatsoever people yeah. look at it as a sign of weakness so even if you're moving up socially technically speaking like i don't know caste wise is it still not it would still be looked down upon as a man to do that okay absolutely absolutely 
So yeah, you're right. Like it, it would not be considered a good sign in society for him to have done any of that, to marry, change his name and stay at his wife's family's home. But he did that, which speaks to his open-mindedness and modern thinking, I would say. Mm-hmm. Totally. Now, Bhopal Singh and Narayani Devi had five children. And at some point in 1990, they sold their farm to move to Delhi in search of better prospects. I thought you were about to say that they sold two of their children. I don't know why that's what I thought you were going to say. Oh, plot twist. I wish they had because they would have survived. (laughs) Oh. Although by that time, their children were grown up. They were adults. Some of them were even married off. What their family members said is that they had spent a lot of money in the weddings of the children, some of the children. I think three of the children got married and Bhopal Singh spent a lot of money in those weddings. And so he was kind of in debt and didn't want to lose face in that local community. Okay. So they sold their farm and left to Delhi to try and make a new life there. Really, Restart, yeah. Yeah. Out of the five children, only Lalit had stayed on with his wife and with his parents in Burari. At some point in the late 90s, Lalit's brother Bhavnesh, his family, and his sister Pratiba, who was now widowed and had a daughter Priyanka, mm-hmm. joined the Bhatia family in the two-story home. Okay. So we have two siblings who didn't move in? Right. Two siblings didn't move in. Okay. And that was Dinesh Chundavat, who preferred to stay in Rajasthan near their other relatives, mm-hmm. and a sister Sujata, who was married and lived with her family somewhere else. Okay. So when Bhavnesh and Pratiba and their families moved in, now the family grew from 5 to 11. By all accounts, Bhopal Singh was the typical male head of the household, the decision maker who was responsible for the overall well-being of the family. Under his guidance, the family survived the big shift to a big city and they managed to make a decent living for themselves. Everyone in the family sought his advice on various family matters. Friends and neighbors remember Bhopal Singh as being a broad-minded, well-loved, and respected person. He wasn't known to be any kind of a brute or abusive person at all. Like, you would assume when something happens like this, that there was some kind of an abusive head of the household who was manipulating everyone. Bhopal Singh was not that person. Mm -hmm. If he were alive, neighbors speculate, that this would never have happened. So in late 2006, Bhopal Singh died of natural causes. And this left a huge void of authority in the family. Where would they go? Who would they consult in their times of need now? It's almost as if they felt powerless despite being capable grown adults. Now this is not uncommon in most Asian societies. The elders really do take the highest positions and stakes in society. And their words are considered golden. Mm -hmm. Whatever they say goes. To steer the Bhatia family in the right direction, a new leader emerged from within. Who's it going to be? The then 34-year-old Lalit. Despite being the youngest of all Bhatia children, he was going to be the one to lead the family from now on. No offense to all the Lalits out there, but it's definitely the creepiest name in the family. So like... I don't know. Like Lilith? Yes. Lilith and Lilith. Yeah. He was quickly accepted by the family as their head, as he was considered the most intelligent of all the siblings and the youngest. They kind of depended on him and looked to him to make all the smart decisions. Let's talk about Lalit. Okay. Lalit had experienced quite a few rough patches of trauma in his life. At the young age of 18, he met with a very serious motorcycle accident and oh. suffered from a head injury he was hospitalized for long periods of time and missed his exams eventually leading to him dropping out of his studies for a medical degree so he was on track uh, slated to do you know good things he was going to probably become a doctor or a pharmacist i don't know exactly what but he had to drop out because of this head injury damn i'm sure that affected him deeply sure. not just physically but emotionally Friends described him as being very jovial and social and often cracking jokes, engaging others in conversation till late at night. So he seemed normal. Nothing about him seemed abnormal. Mm -hmm. Even after the accident? 
After the accident, friends observed that he would often fall asleep at any time of day. So something was definitely going on in his brain. Right. The biochemistry was off. and They just didn't know how. And they didn't, maybe they probably didn't even suspect it. That's so scary. Like, you just bonk your head a little too hard. I mean, a serious motor accident is a different thing, but yeah, you could just fall really hard on the ground and hit your head. And it's such a luck of the draw, what got shaken up or what didn't get shaken up. Yeah, always wear a helmet at all times. Even if you're not on a bike, just wear a helmet. <laughs> just walk around with a helmet. <laughs> we need to start this fashion trend. I mean, yeah, you could put like speakers in there and like a little fan and like a perfume pod that you could smell nice things. It would be amazing. You'd <laughs> kind of be in like your own walking spa at all times. Wait, it's a full like <laughs> face covering helmet. <laughs> yes, yeah, like a little astronaut glass bubble on the head you know that's what i'm talking about okay i was thinking like you know just like a bicycle <laughs> no 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 i'm going all in i'm going all in i want this walking head spa full astronaut okay someone like from the past is gonna rip through a time thing and see never mind i was trying to make like a future sci-fi reference but i don't, yeah. I don't know <laughs> Steal our ideas, time travelers. They're just going to see a bunch of people in helmets and think that's the ne like the next, you know, the next evolutionary step. I mean, we're all isolated in our world anyway. If you're just going to stare at a phone, just put the phone screen in the helmet. There you go. Yeah. Put everything you need in the helmet. You don't even have to look at or talk to other people ever again. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Just a quick break so I can tell you about a new podcast. How I Met You is an Asian podcast about love, where couples share how and why they find their forever love in this crazy world. They'll take you through their journey from when they met, their biggest arguments, and even their less than perfect proposals, like this one. I took the ring out of the box, right? So it's just in my pocket. And I put it in my back pocket. So for a period, I was standing in front of her scratching my butt. <laughs> Like, yeah. Yeah. Finding the ring, uh, right? <laughs> he was like, just scratching. I was like, why are you scratching your butt? And I was like, I, I sort of knew already, but it was very funny to see. Yeah. And then I went down on one knee after that conclusion, right? And I asked her, Will you marry me? Yes, of course. <laughs> if you like that, take a look at How I Met You. The link will be in our show notes. And now, back to our episode. Okay, this incident definitely was a physical trauma that he suffered. And then years later in 2004, while working at a lumber shop, he had a payment dispute with his employer and was almost killed in retaliation. What? The employer's men brutally beat up Lalith, placed a heavy pile of plywood on top of him. What? Locked the room and set it on fire. Oh my god, jeez. Yeah, Hare Krishna. He barely survived by regaining consciousness at the right time briefly and calling his brother on his cell phone asking for help. That's the oh only god. reason he was even alive after that incident. If he had never regained consciousness, he would have died in that fire. As a trauma response to this horrific accident or incident mm -hmm. or attempt to murder, really, if you think about it. Absolutely. He had lost his voice for nearly three years. He just stopped talking. That's such an interesting response that happens to people. Medically, the doctors couldn't figure out why he had stopped talking and why he had lost his voice. Mm -hmm. They assumed that it was a psychological response to trauma. And Lalit was even advised to go see a psychiatrist to address this issue. But he didn't do that. He did not seek help. Because they believed only crazy people need psychiatric help. That's stupid. The stigma of mm -hmm. seeking help for one's mental health is still pretty high in most of yeah. South Asia. And this incident likely caused him to suffer from mental trauma that was left untreated. I'm sure he had some form of PTSD and triggers and stuff from the incident that he never addressed right just internalized all of it 
There was some debate about whether he truly lost his voice or he was pretending. And we can talk about that in our next episode where we discuss theories. Mm -hmm. Keep a note, like make a note of that and we'll talk about it in the next episode. So during these three years, Lalit communicated by writing. And that's all he did. Even with his best friends, he was still reserved. It's not like he was writing jokes and being funny and trivial with them like he used to be. Mm -hmm. His father died. And his son Shivam was born during this three-year period. Of silence. So he never even talked to his baby son. And I'm wondering how his son was conceived in silence. How did that go? Oh, I don't like that idea. Did he write it? Did he write it to her? Like, hey, Hey, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, (sighs) just I don't know why I thought of that, but it, it made me uncomfortable. Interesting point. Lalit communicated that the family needed to start praying three times a day to help him regain his voice. And the dutiful family did just that. They were loving, they were caring, right? This was just how they were. They were good people. So they started a whole year of religious fervor. But don't usually prayers like puja chanting, isn't that usually prescribed by like a... Pujari, like a priest? A a priest, yeah. He was their know-it-all, Mr. Know-it-all. He was the head of the family now because the father's dead, remember? Bhopal Singh has died. So he is directing them as per his design. What he says goes. Hmm. Now one day, after a whole year of praying three times a day, suddenly Lalit started to sing the prayer and got his voice back. Oh, This feat was no short of a divine miracle in the eyes of the Bhatia family. Because what he had said happened, right? Yeah. He said, pray for my voice. They prayed. He got his voice. And so their religious belief and their belief in Lalit was strengthened, especially upon the reinforcement given to them by Lalit, saying, Mm -hmm. see, it worked. I find this to be a horrible case of confirmation bias. Right. Yeah. It's just... These people are just too nice, too believing. I don't know. I don't want to blame them at all. They are victims. I just feel really bad for their situation. I feel like also this is sort of a small, it, it's not a small thing, but it is sort of a small thing. It's like the beginning of something. It's the first confirmation that's going to lead to the next confirmation to the, I don't know where this is going to go, but it seems like a dangerous sort of first step in a weird direction. An expert or a doctor in the documentary talks about this. How cults are started Mm -hmm. is by some kind of performance of miracles. Something that's unbelievable and unnatural. When that occurs, suddenly now you have followers. So most cults have supernatural origins like that, where the leader has performed some kind of miracle. Right. Usually some weird magical things happening that convince people to believe him or her and follow them. And so, yes, this was that catalyst, which kind of cemented this family's faith that day. Mm -hmm. Now, Lalit told the family that he had started to see his father, Bhopal Singh, in his dreams. And that Bhopal Singh said he would now guide them on family matters. Who would guide them? Bhopal Singh would guide them. Okay. Now, they claim this indeed was the blessing of their late father, Bhopal Singh, who was watching over them. Who doesn't want to believe that? That sounds great. Especially if you have this thing happening on a more macro level with cults, why there was sort of this, both the surging of cults and flower power and spirituality in the, what was it, like 70s, 60s, -hmm. was because there was a vacuum created where like people were sort of becoming disenchanted by traditional religion. And this is like a micro example of that, where the father was the religion and then a vacuum was created and they needed something to like turn to. And the the son is... Oh, no, actually, you don't have to turn to anything. We'll just go back to the fatherhead, the godfatherhead. I'll be the conduit. They did this in Rebound. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems so beautiful, right? Like, who wouldn't want to think about and believe that their beloved departed family member is watching over them and guiding them 
And he's not telling you to go commit murder. He's going to tell you to do nice things, good things for the betterment of the family. Who wouldn't want to believe that? Yeah. Every major religion has that belief that your loved ones are watching over you and always with you. So it's not so absurd. Totally. And again, this idea that I have of like, well, this seems like a one small thing. You know, there's no harm in praying. And even if it isn't like the prayer that brought the voice back, the prayer didn't obviously harm do any damage it didn't do any damage so might as well just keep going with it and see like what the next thing brings that's how it started Mm. lalit definitely grew reserved and withdrawn from this point on after that fire incident and this three years of silence and then when his voice came back he was reserved he was withdrawn he was not his usual self Mm -hmm. and this incident was the turning point in the family's path to their untimely deaths. An unseen catalyst, a disaster in slow motion, was in play, and no one saw this coming. Now let's go through some of the evidence and the diaries, which was the key to opening up this enigma a little bit. Doesn't explain it all, but gives us a little peek into this case. Now, the crime branch led by Deputy Commissioner Dr. Joy N. Tirke, in conjunction with the Forensic Science Labs in Delhi, scoured the Bhatia home for evidence and clues. They found no signs of forced entry, no struggle. Nothing appeared to be out of place, knocked over, or stolen from the home. All the jewelry on the family members was intact. And Indians wear a lot of gold. I mean, not like dripping in it, but everyone has at least earrings, rings, necklaces. So that's enough for a robber, right? 11 Mm -hmm. family members. He would have made a killing that night. But um, It did not look like a robbery or crime of opportunity at all. They found evidence of a havan or a fire ritual performed the night before. So like a little metal bowl type thing where you burn firewood and then do all kinds of rituals on top of that. The religious items kept at home were checked and tucked beside a small temple enclosure. They found an ordinary lined notebook. Mm -hmm. This was no ordinary notebook. Uh The diary contained instructions for family on how to live their lives. Minute, mundane details were laid out, both religious and otherwise. It was written in third person and in a chastising, stern tone. Upon further investigation, 11 such notebooks were found, dated from June 2007 to 24th June 2018, just seven days before the deaths. So they had one book for each year, 11 notebooks. Oh my God, 11 years of this? 11 years of this. (gasps) And there's the number 11 again. Oh my gosh. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe we should rename the episode to Unlucky 11. Unlucky 11. Indeed. Handwriting experts concluded that the diaries had all been written by Priyanka, the 33-year-old, the one who worked at the IT company, the one who got engaged. And some of the entries were also done by Neetu, who was the 25-year-old who was looking for a job at that time. So the young girls were writing in the book. Lalit was not writing in this book. Why was Lalit not writing? Was he dictating? Lalit's wife, Tina, had told some of her relatives, as well as some close family friends, that Lalit had started hearing his father's voice, auditory hallucinations, and that Bhopal Singh's spirit would enter Lalit's body and talk to the family. Oh my gosh. So that's why Lalit was not writing, because he was possessed apparently. (gasps) Just a few people knew about this. It was not a widely known or believed fact. This was not something people knew about, that this is what the family believed was happening. Yeah. The writings were studied by many psychologists and by the crime branch, and they came to the conclusion that the third-person perspective in the diary was meant to belong to Bhopal Singh Chundavat or Bhopal Singh Bhatia. And the diaries were a record of what Lalit had been saying during his episodes of possession by Bhopal Singh. So although I don't think it is said like in black and white that I am Bhopal Singh, 
it's meant to convey that. It's implied that these instructions are coming from him. The diaries were eerie, no doubt. It dictated how and when the family should pray, where to in invest money, whom to avoid or help, the exact roles of each family member, like Savita was supposed to cook in the kitchen all day and not do anything else, really. <laughs> Tina was given certain roles. Most of the instructions were centered around how Lalit and his wife Tina should be treated, respected, and modeled after. Okay. I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah. it is Lalit saying all this, so... Right. <sighs> there were punishments for minor infractions and lots of repenting in the form of prayers and offerings that were suggested in these diaries. Everything is a sin. Everything is yeah. potential for committing sin and be careful and don't do this and don't do that. And if you have, you have to do so-and-so stuff to fix it. Very guilt-based. Guilt-tripping. Guilt-tripping everyone into just believing in all of this and feeling helpless. Mm. Again and again, it was written in the diary that nobody should ever disobey any of the instructions given or they would suffer. They would suffer as a family. Now, they were made to feel like even if they did repent, that they were never truly free of their past misdeeds or mistakes, mm -hmm. no matter how small or insignificant they might have been. Now, these were good people. I don't expect they're going out and committing crimes and like... <laughs> yeah, like what, what mistakes are they making in life? What's the worst that they're up to? There was mention of like the boys spending too much time on their phone. That was considered like an infraction. Wow. Yeah. So it okay. seems a little extreme controlling. It's just like stuff that was annoying Lilith, ultimately. You're right. Yeah. All this weird manipulation helped in creating an emotional and mental trap for the family mm -hmm. that they felt they couldn't escape from. If you're constantly being told what to do, what not to do, and how you are not in control of what's happening, you really are trapped. You feel helpless. You feel yeah. unable to get out of this thing unless some external force or external person intervenes. Right. And of course, they were told never to talk about this outside of the home. So no one really knew except his wife, Tina, who went blabbering to a few people. Okay, first of all, that's a red flag. I feel like if anyone ever tells you not to talk about something... Put it on Twitter. Yeah, put it on blast. <laughs> Make a poster. Get it tattooed on your <laughs> forehead. <laughs> this is the part that people couldn't wrap their heads around. How did they never tell anyone? Well, Tina did tell some people. That's how we know about it. Apart from the diaries, that's how we know about it. But still, the kids never told anyone. Like, kids talk. But maybe they just thought this was normal. This is what every house is like. And since it was, it you know, it was taken to the level where it was mundane. So it was like not even something they would find interesting or noteworthy to talk about. Maybe. Like, I was just thinking it's so weird to think of like how family becomes like a mini society and it can be turned into like a mini cult. Like I was saying, some super ooey gooey families. And I'm like, what? how do you people live like this? But from the external, like, you know, our family lives will be strange to someone else because they have their own mini society. Yeah. Not everything was negative, though. There were positive reinforcements in the diaries, too, about any success that the family had experienced. All those successes were immediately attributed to their adherence to the rules. Right. So they couldn't even claim any credit for their own accomplishments. Everything was just given unto them from this higher power for doing their bidding, essentially. That's like they have no agency, really. Right. If something good happens, it's because of this power. If something bad happens, it's because of us. Right. Yeah, yeah. there's no winning. Yeah, this is uh, heads you win, tails you lose. No, what is it? What's the thing? Heads you lose, tails you draw. Heads you lose, tails you win. No. I don't there's know. There's something where, there's a thing where Alvin <laughs> says this, like both cases you lose. There's a thing. Is it heads you win, heads you win, tails how can, I lose? How can you win if you lose? Heads you win, tails I lose. That means you win in both. No. No, you don't. 
Because in heads, the other person can win, right? <laughs> this is oh, God. word math, and I am not uh, good at math. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no. Oh, forget it. Forget it. I'll, I'll ask my husband what this stupid thing is. Okay. <laughs> Just reading this is suffocating. It's bad. It's awfully oppressive and exploitative. Very, very bad. Bad news. This is 100% a cult led by a mentally ill person. There's just no justification of any of this. Now, the children were all young when it began. The youngest being born into this. I think the family seriously believed all of these superstitions and delusions that Lalit spewed onto them. And being the head of the household, he had the authority and they didn't dare upset the apple cart, so to speak. Yeah. And so this became their lives. And the mystifying part to us and the public is why they kept quiet this whole time. Why didn't they stop it? Why didn't they leave? They could have. They were not actual prisoners. And this is where we will stop today's episode. Okay. And pick up in our part two of the Burari Banyan tree ritual, where we will talk about all the activities that the family did weeks before this incident. Yeah, well, basically we have to connect this like weird home life of the perfect family that has some something strange was going on to 11 people dead. Hanging. Hanging in their house, leaving their poor dog Tommy on the roof. Just as for Tommy. What happened? What changed or what was going to change that triggered this event mm-hmm. that night? That is where we'll pick up next week. Uh, hopefully next week. It could be in two weeks, like I always say. <laughs> Don't bet on dates with us, okay? <laughs> Time is relative. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. It's a flat circle. We're okay? running on IST here. It's all happening at the same time, everywhere at once. So, yeah. Let's let's try to unlock uh, this mystery we we're, were I mean spoiler alert we're not going to figure it out but we can speculate you know let's do that Alex do you have anything else to add before we sign off so a little bit of rebellion in the household let's encourage it that's what I have to say like listen to your father but also question him sometimes yeah they're not gods <laughs> <laughs> you know poke the bear <laughs> Be a bit annoying. You know, a a dash. Stir shit up. We'll leave you with these uh, very uh, stoic thoughts. (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. So follow the things. Check us out on the Instagrams at Crimes from the East. You can uh, see what's cooking on my Instagram at Other Alex B. And like us, review us. Send us fan mail. We received some very nice fan mail recently, not just people telling us that we babble incessantly, but we like mm-hmm. that review too, because at least yeah. you were listening. Support us on Patreon or buy me a coffee. It's all there on our website at Crumbs from the East Doubt Cam. And now I can say, join us again for part two of this episode. At Crimes from the East, your Desi True Crime podcast with a little masala, masala. and spice. Spice! Namaste! Dun, 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 dun.